You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Hello, please let me see your ticket subs for the Double Edge Double Bill. Tonight, we belt out a Bohemian Rhapsody in gold on the Academy Network. Each week, Adam Thomas and Thomas Mariani will come to the table to discuss the randomly selected yin and yang of a double feature. Then, both will have to pick a number between 1 and 10 in order to seal their fates for the next episode. One will have two good movies, the other two bad ones. Let the chaos begin. And I am Thomas Mariani, your good old-fashioned lover boy. And I am Adam Thomas, and I am a lame-o, lame-o. But uh, we're not the only people here, Adam, uh, because we have somebody over on uh, the third chair there who was messed with the primal forces of nature, and he will atone. And he is, of course, the host of Have Not Seen This, a great podcast you all should listen to, Mr. Rafe Telsch. Rafe, welcome back. Thank you. I'm glad to be back. And, you know, podcasting isn't the truth. Podcasting is a goddamn amusement park. I mean, yeah, it's pretty much, it's like this movie. You're just like, it's all happening. It's all real. (laughs) There's there's no satire in this statement (laughs) whatsoever, which we'll get into. But if you're new, welcome. And uh, basically every week on this show, Adam and I uh, end up uh, discussing a double feature that was picked at the end of the previous episode. At the end of this episode, we'll pick our next week's double feature. So stay tuned for our pick at the very end. And uh, we ended up uh, for this week in honor of the Academy Awards are oncoming. Um, It's a truncated award season, uh, but uh, we're going to have the 92nd Academy Awards in about two weeks from when we're recording this. And uh, we ended up with our good pick, uh, which was... Mind of Network from 1976, and Bohemian Rhapsody uh, from 2018, which was Adam's bad pick. And uh, both of these aren't movies that say one best picture. They were both nominated. Uh, much like last year, we did one just about best picture winners in general, when the Oscars were around that time. Uh, but we decided to do just uh, Academy Award Darlings, which are movies that end up uh, at least with three or more nominations, was the stipulation we did. Because it's so weird how many movies that are either huge classics or completely forgotten to time rack up massive amounts of nominations and i'm guessing rafe that's a big reason why you wanted to come on to this particular episode when we invite you back yeah especially looking at older films you know through your podcast through my podcast it's interesting to see movies that were nominated for oscars that pretty much everybody has forgotten or films that were captivated by that get almost no academy attention i think the academy awards you know adam said it really well last week you can't really be a cinemaphile and not pay attention to the oscars but I almost think sometimes we give them too much or too little weight. That's true, because we talked about this last year when we did our last Oscar show, that so many movies that I think don't deserve a huge amount of hate get that kind of hate because of the sort of academic attention. I think like the, the textbook example is like a Shakespeare in Love, which I think is a fun, cute little movie that so many people hate on because of the Saving Private Ryan steal, which I think is a bit unfair. Well, and the classic example, of course, being, you know, Star Wars versus Annie Hall. You know, which one has gone on to make a larger cultural footprint versus which one was the better picture? And lots of factors you have to take into account. And the biggest problem I have with the Oscars is I think they're too soon, especially with all the movies being released in what they call Oscar season. I I don't think there's enough distance for perspective of what is actually the more significant contribution to the cinematic world. Or even then, like the Academy Awards just like really honed in on that particular season you're talking about, which is like October to December when all those bigger movies come out. And meanwhile, we ignore like the whole rest of the year, pretty much. Exactly. This year, like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is like the furthest back. And that was like July. And that's like the one. Yeah. And it used to be you got pictures from all around the year. I mean, you could count on movies being released in February or March, getting some sort of Oscar consideration, at least a consideration, if not a nomination. But now it's pretty much just forget about it. I mean, and so many get released to one or two theaters in order to be Oscar eligible and then don't go wide until they've gotten the nomination. Right. And the general public is like, what the hell is this movie? That They have no idea. Exactly. Even great movies like a fucking Parasite. Like my dad asked me, like, what the fuck's Parasite? I have no idea what this is, <laughs> <laughs> which is a bummer because it's a great fucking movie. Uh, but 
But you generally agree with all these sentiments, Adam? No, I think you both are wrong. No, absolutely, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I 100% agree. Uh, it's, I mean, it's become a, a, a common term now, Oscar bait movies. You can just tell from previews alone nowadays, or even just subject matter, like, okay, well, they're releasing this to go for the awards. It's, it's not a surprise anymore. It doesn't really have an effect on what movies I'll watch anymore, like it might have used to. There are still movies in categories like the foreign language or even the short films or the short form animation, stuff like that, that I I do pay attention to the ones nominated in that because otherwise I probably wouldn't know about them. So that's the one thing about the Oscars that I I do still thoroughly enjoy. But other than that, it's you know who's going to win for the most part, at least for the last quite a few years. It's almost a guarantee every year which one's going to win. Like, there's no question last year that that fucking Green Book was going to win. Well, and especially because, like, something like seven out of eight or eight out of nine of the last, you know, years, it's been a a biopic that's won, you know, for acting, especially for lead actor. It's been somebody playing somebody else. If it's a racial tension movie or a biopic, like you said, it's almost guaranteed to win nowadays. But then it's always usually one that doesn't quite have it on the right spectrum, like a Green Book or the infamous Crash Year. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> what but a the, piece of shit. Really, the, the only thing that the Academy Awards can really do that I think still uh, lasts to this day is just at least give more attention to smaller movies. Like, I would have never watched, like, back in the day, A Pan's Labyrinth without, like, the Academy attention. Really? Like, I would have had no idea what that movie was. I was younger... And I was just like, oh, it's a Spanish language movie, whatever. But I heard like all this like attention around Pan's Labyrinth. That was the first Del Toro movie I saw. Oh, okay. I, that like really opened up. Like, oh my god, this guy's great, and that led me down the rabbit hole of all his other movies. So I think that's the big thing can do is at least like get more attention for those kind of movies, like a Parasite, instead of just like nominating the same movies over and over again. Which then again, this year it's like what even in like the, all the other categories, it's mostly Best Picture nominees as opposed to like actually spreading the wealth out to other movies that deserve a bit more attention. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but Joker exists, so. Oh, oh God, Joker. Uh, well, well, that's a lot to go on a play now. We could go on and on about Joker. But let's go ahead and get into our two movies. So we'll start off first with 1976's Network. And now, Mr. Howard Beale. I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. What the hell's going on? Prepare yourself for a perfectly outrageous motion picture. I am not putting Howard back on the air. It's not your show anymore, Max. It's mine. Why me? It was your own television, dummy. Network television will never be the same. So, uh, Network came out November 27th, 1976, directed by Sidney Lumet, with a script by Patty Chayefsky, um, and was nominated for 10 Academy Awards at the time, including, uh, it won for Original Screenplay, Best Actress for Faye Dunaway, Best Supporting Actress for Beatrice Strait, and, uh, Best Actor for Peter Finch, uh, which unfortunately was a posthumous Oscar, the first of only two so far in the Academy's history. This was a movie that was hailed at the time for, like, oh, it's such an insightful, interesting satire of the news business. In 1976, how far and silly this all could go. And here we are. <laughs> yeah. That's really the thing with this movie, especially like watching it this time made me realize what it is. It's like you when you watch this movie, you get sort of like almost drunk on the amazing performances, incredible script writing, the really immersive direction of it. You're just going to get drunk and giddy off of that. And then around the time when the Ned Beatty scene happens, which we'll talk about in detail, that's the moment where you just really sober up and realize oh, it's it's just reality now. <laughs> this is just, like, exactly what's fucking going on. And it just really, like, hits you hard. All of this could be happening right now, and it potentially is. There's no doubt to me that there are people that are still on the air or given voices to whether you want to be in the news media or on television in general, or even radio or podcasting, who are clinically insane. But they get ratings, they get people talking, they get whatever, so they're kept on. And then... You know, how it goes with everything else. The second it starts to lose any sort of popularity, it's forced off. Maybe not to this extreme, but still. It's it's kind of disgusting, really. And it's a very sobering sort of idea. Uh, just how perverted the whole idea of television media really probably is. I mean, I'm not a reporter. I don't work in the field. Well, t- I mean, I guess I do. I am on a podcast. But... Um, we bring the news to people's homes, Adam. That's what we do. Absolutely. You fucks. But it's depressing. It's incredibly depressing, this movie. I mean, it's it's a, one of the greatest movies ever made. 
in my opinion, but it's also incredibly, incredibly upsetting and depressing. So Howard Beale's the original YouTube vlogger is what you're saying. He's Alex Jones. <laughs> <laughs> Howard Beale's Alex Jones. I don't think I go that far, but yeah. <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> well, uh, Rafe, um, uh, what, what was your first experience with this movie and how do you think it, uh, it holds up now in a modern respect? Well, my first experience with this movie was actually really interesting. When I first went to college, I went in broadcasting school, and this was shown in our media ethics course uh, early on in the semester as a, a point of discussion about ethics in broadcasting. Uh, and I kind of think more schools probably should have integrated that into their curriculum so that we didn't have the mess in the world of broadcasting that we have now. I love this movie. It is sad how prescient it has become. And at the same time, uh, you know, it's, it's like we can watch this, but we didn't really learn anything from it. We still run into a lot of the same problems, not only on the broadcasting side, where they really have become ratings crazy, especially as they've become their own networks, but also on the consumer side where we continue to deify, you know, the, the people on the TV screen, whether it's the newscasters or the celebrity of the week. It used to be you could show people a pictures of like great thinkers of the last century and you could show them pictures of the Kardashians and you know which ones they would recognize. And this really hits on that cult of celebrity idea. But at the same time, you know, the, the ethics in media, the ethics in broadcasting, and I, I mean, not to bring it to podcasting, but I guess to bring it to podcasting is, is you know, it, it's given anybody who has a microphone the opportunity to have a voice out there. And just because you can do it doesn't always mean you should do it. There is no double edge, double bill. There is no have not seen this. There is only WTF and all this other bullshit. <laughs> it's, it's pretty much. I mean, yeah, it's um, it, it's stunning how even like the the big sort of famous moment of this movie, the whole I'm mad as hell, I'm not taking this anymore, and how that inspires people to yell into like a big black void. It's the internet. It's a meme that's just being perpetrated over and over again by a large group of people they're just doing. Like, that's the thing. It's like, Patty Chayefsky, who was, like, a very celebrated writer in his time, he had won an Oscar previously for Marty and won another Oscar for this, obviously. It's clearly, like, trying to be funny, and there's so there's genuinely, like, really funny moments throughout this whole movie. But at the same time, so much of it hits so hard that the humor is still just more of, like, a weird, respectable, sort of satirical, sardonic laugh of, like, yep, it's just, it's fucking happening now. Yeah, and yet he wasn't trying to be satirical. He was trying to be honest. And the the direction society has taken is what's really turned it into more and more of a satire. If you went, if you sat down and watched this the year it came out, I, I don't think the satire side of it would be so sharp as it is now. It's because of what's happened to our media consumption that's caused this to become a stronger satirical piece. The problem is... Chayefsky was able to predict this going on, but he didn't give us any answers. People are still mad as hell, but what are they doing about it other than just vomiting on the internet about their anger? And, and that's the same problem the movie had. He has everybody go to the window and yell, I'm as mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. And what does it do? It makes him a celebrity. It, it gets him even more into the public eye, but it doesn't give a solution to the problem. Even when they do affect some kind of change, when they get that business deal to stop by like sending telegrams and stuff to the white house and shit like that, that's immediately squashed when you have like a Ned Beatty just completely destroy Howard Beale's concept of his power. It just like really just escalates further and further. God, that's such a brilliant scene though. I mean, there's, there's three really fundamentally key speeches in this movie and every, you know, as memorable as that I'm as mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore is I really think it's the least powerful of the three speeches. And I think that the one you're talking about is probably the, the most powerful of the three and, and also even more true today. It's not governments, it's corporations. Yeah. All that's missing from that is literally just, he needs to put in Disney because this time they were like flailing and bankrupt almost at this point in the seventies and just add in Disney and it's still incredibly accurate. <laughs> Right, because the companies he lists there are ones that are still around today. Yeah. It's so prescient still to this day. And I do agree with you, Rafe. I don't think uh, back when this came out, if you'd have saw it, that it maybe would have hit uh, as close to home as it does now. But there's no question that these just sick tactics and backhanded deals just for money, exploitation of people and their fragile states – Everything. I mean, it's just happening on the 
uh, daily. It's all the time. It's all the time. I mean, reality TV alone is, is just you want to watch a couple of sociopaths in a room. You can almost put on any reality TV show where we're just as a populace eating it up for consumption. We don't even give a shit about anybody's well-being, anybody's anything. It, it's just bullshit. Like he, like his first major, well, his second speech. And this is as someone who's a contributor to the grand scale of it for the most part. It's very harrowing. Wonderful, wonderful performances. Ned Beatty alone, it's like, I'm not used to seeing Ned Beatty like that. It's it's just so powerful from all angles. Be it Faye Dunaway, who's just a cold, calculating, emotionally just shut off person who only cares about ratings and numbers. Or be it Max, who you know, has some integrity in the beginning, you know, as far as, you know, no, we can't put him on the air. Oh my God, that's my friend. He's crazy. We need to get him help. We need him help. But then he just turns out to be an adulterer. And Robert Duvall is basically Satan. I mean, for the most part, (laughs) Uh, this is probably one of the greatest movies I've ever seen that I don't get any sense of enjoyment out of. It's very disturbing. It's very harrowing. It's very poignant impression and realistic at least as far as i know in my limited knowledge of this type of world but it's 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 a powerful powerful piece of film well i think what's so fascinating about it is that I, you mentioned like some of these characters might be emotionless what i kind of love about the performances and lamette's direction is that any of these people like even like a robert duvall or a faye dunaway as much as what they're doing is monstrous what i like is that all of them sort of play the emotional stakes of the ratings or whatever thing they're kind of coming after, no matter how inhuman it is as like something they emotionally strive for in their own way. I think that's what's so interesting. Like each character has their own reality that they could 100% commit to. And these goals that seem once again, like inhuman, but at the same time, their end all be all. And I think that's what's so fascinating. They're not robots. They are human people that have these emotional drives. They're just in the most backwards of places possible. Well, and that's exemplified in Dunaway's scene, you know, where she's talking about the ratings and getting the share and having sex. And that's that's her orgasm. It's not the physicality of the sex. It's that she managed to achieve, you know, such a big rating success. And I, I found it really interesting. You know, Dunaway was told not to try and find a redemptive trait for the character that as she was doing her character work for the part, if she tried to redeem the character in any way, if she tried to justify the character in any way, it would be left on the editing room floor. They wanted her to just be purely driven by the ratings and cold and calculating uh, as as Adam put it, you know, that's that's the character. And there are people out there like that. We don't want to necessarily see them on the screen in movies, but there are people out there like that. And she's she nails this performance. I mean, she, this is probably my, for several of these actors. This is probably my favorite performance of theirs and Dunaway. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, what I was really worried coming to visit it this time because it's been a while since I'd seen it. If like with the Dunaway character come off as more just like, oh, completely cold bitch. And what I like is that she has a lot of that in her performance, but also there's weird moments that, like, you get at least, like, some sort of thing. Well, I know that was what she was directed to do by Lamette, was kind of, like, hide any kind of vulnerability. But, I like, there's one special moment where, like, William Holden's talking about leaving her and saying, like, well, can't you just love me, like, warts and all and all this other stuff unconditionally? And she just has this brief pause and says, I can't do that. Like, she can't quite even contemplate what's being driven toward her it's almost like the tragic robotic thing when like a robot tries to understand love and they quite can't but you see that there's like actual emotion that's there behind her character but without like her crying or her welling up in tears it feels like a very much like just a person who can't contemplate that specific type of emotion toward another person which like says so much about how flawed and interesting she is as a character Mm -hmm. but in the same scene you know he says you know i'm gonna leave because you can't do this, you can't do that. She's fine, go, and if fine, I'm leaving. And then she literally, like, literally says, don't leave. And then he's, I have to because of what you've become and what I'll become and blah, blah, blah. And it's, it's, she's got that moment, that just one quick moment of actually having, I don't want to call it human vulnerability, but in a way it is. And, uh, and I mean, she snaps immediately back to reality. It's, you get the impression from a lot of these characters, her, her character in particular, that they probably had a pretty shitty sort of upbringing or a shitty deal. You know, maybe unattentive family members or whatever it is. But she's so married to the job, which can be dangerous really in any field. But when it comes to something like this where, you know, 20 points is your orgasm, it's sad more than anything. Like you almost feel bad for her in a way. 
But at the same time, she does a lot of terrible shit in this, too. Well, right, especially because William Holden also, what I like about their relationship is you can tell it's very much from a perspective, like, he kind of sees his old gumption drive when he was a kid in this field initially coming up into it in her, and he kind of wants that back, and he wants to do that by, like, lobbing onto her and completely betraying, like, so many people, like, we can't go too much farther without mentioning Beatrice Strait has five minutes and 20 seconds in this movie, and she's so phenomenal in one scene she won an Oscar for it. Completely deserved. It's still the shortest amount of time anyone's ever won an Oscar for a performance, and it's stellar. It's just, like, one of the best compacted, like, bang-for-your-buck performances I've ever seen in a movie. And you can see how much, like, that... He's, like, losing out on, like, this very passionate, beautiful woman because he wants to, like, glob onto something he used to have. And he even says at the end, like, I guess, you know, I'm going to try and go back to my wife, but that's probably not going to happen. It's, she's probably not going to go for this or whatever. So it shows that, like, even he also has, like, all these same foibles that we're talking about he's just like distant enough to realize like i fucked up completely by being married to the job yeah his problems are personal but you get the impression that he's completely professional about his job uh, whereas with like her character you know there there is no separation between personal and professional because her personal life is her job mm-hmm. yeah and, and you know even to, with the way he was talking to uh his wife when he was telling her what was going on and everything, it, he was even treating his personal problems like they are professional ones. He was very sort of straightforward about it, calculated, these are the facts, this is what it is. Which, you know, sometimes can be the right way to go about things, I'd argue. In this case, maybe not. But I don't want to call it a lighter note. But am I the only one who anytime Beatrice straight, anytime I see her, all I can think of is Poltergeist? <laughs> this is where I made the connection. I didn't even, like, really put it together until this watch. It's like, oh yeah, she is the lady from Bullshit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But no, to go back to somebody else, uh, Duvall. Uh, first of all, I love Robert Duvall. I love him in almost anything he's in. He's been in some shitty films, but he's always good. And God damn, is he good? They, they keep this guy in the air and he's literally going crazy and, selling him up, you know, about the Saudis and the Arabs and all the money and everything. He's potentially ruining them. And the only thing he can think of is, my, my career's over. I'm, it's over. It's over. It's over. You know, I was the golden goose, and now look at me. Well, dude, you, you kept a crazy person on the air, a knowingly sociopath who's literally fainting. He's so fucking exhausted. It's just, god damn it, I you hate him. <laughs> Who announced that he was going to commit suicide on the air? You know, I mean, right, exactly. that's, that's the point that you pull the plug on him. And you don't bring him back for anything else, let alone I, raise him up to, you know, an icon of the network. Yeah, instantly, right? I mean, don't you think, okay, he's got problems, get him help. I love that scene where he makes that announcement because we're seeing it on the screens in the control booth where nobody's paying attention. <laughs> and it yes. actually isn't until like five seconds after he says that, that they're like, wait a minute, what did he just say? You know, I mean, that's how detached they are. Because he's old news. He's out the door. So they're not even paying attention to what's being broadcast. And it's only because he's like they wouldn't have been able to pl- pull the plug fast enough if he had actually instead of announcing he was going to do it in a week, if he had decided I'm going to do it right now. Yeah, they're so used to the routine of what he's going to say that they don't even pay any attention to him anymore. That they completely cast aside this actual human person who was just like, oh, no, he's, he's dead weight. It doesn't matter. He's a he's a lame duck. And yeah, yeah I, I love the, just the reaction time of just wait, what? What, yeah. <laughs> what would happen? <laughs> like, I the think there's really funny bits in this movie that, like, still kind of ring true, even in, amongst, like, the awkwardness. Like, I do love the bit where Howard is, like, completely soaked and comes to the TV station, and the guard guy is just like, well, hello, Mr. Beale, I must be witnessed. All right, Mr. Beale. <laughs> he just, like, right. closes the door. There's still really funny bits in here. Also, I mean, we've talked about the performances, and, and they are all stellar, but, I, you know, the way the film is shot is also what I feel like makes this an Oscar caliber movie and one that deserves to be remembered. I mean, as I said, you get that one shot that is in the control booth a lot. And what we're seeing of Howard Beale is actually on screens in the control booth. You have the, the stark lighting once he does become the, um, what is his title? The madman. Yeah. The something voice of the whatever, but he's basically a televangelist basically. 
and and the way that that's lit in these pools of light with the follow spots following him around. And then, of course, the Ned Beatty scene where he closes the window. So it's all this, these pools of illumination on the, the boardroom table. I mean, it's just the use of light in particular in this movie, but the way they decide to put the camera. I mean, Lumet's direction is just flawless in this film, and it, it definitely raises this up to that higher echelon of film. You can tell it comes from somebody who had so much experience in TV. Like, that's where the city limit got his start, was directing a lot of, like, uh, television, like, plays and series. Like, it, this comes from somebody who clearly has had so much experience in television, especially, like, from its early infancy. And you can tell, like, he's just really knows all the, like, really dark corners that nobody points a camera to. Especially with just how certain things are. Like, I, to speak to your lighting, another great moment, the sort of climactic business meeting with Robert Duvall and Faye mm -hmm. Dunaway and all the other network people, just how perfectly lit it is of just, like, this could be an average, like, writer's room session, but instead it's a business meeting of, like, so, I guess we gotta get rid of them because our shares are down. Uh, let's kill them? Kill them? Kill them? Kill them? Let's lunch. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> That's basically what right, it is. Exactly. They're making that decision with the same seriousness that they would approach. Where are they going for lunch? Yeah. Oh. And, I mean, just the fact that not only do they kill him, they tie it into another show that they already have, and when they do kill him and they're showing the footage on other networks, it's cutting to the life commercial, you know, the cereal Mikey, it's cutting to Coca-Cola commercials. It's cutting to where none of this shit matters to these people. It's just all constant, just input, 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 input. It's just, it's, it's so fucking dark. Well, I, but well to, to use a more modern term, it's content, content, content. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, by ending it with the commer the televisions, you know, cutting the commercials while covering his death, th that's the same detachment as we had in the control room was announced he's going to commit suicide. You know, it's that same level. It's just now the audience is, is participating in it instead of just the people making the television. And even like the visual thing you're talking about where in terms of like how much this has lasted, that's that visual of like all the TV monitors and stuff is something that fucking Joker stole right out just this year. One of the best picture nominees is clearly still influenced by this movie to this day. Well, so that's because Joker was influenced by a lot of Best Picture nominations. What? Never! I was just going to say, are you telling me <laughs> that Todd Phillips' Joker is not derivative from like 30,000 other films? Next thing you were going to say, Taxi Driver and King of Comedy were influences, Rafe. How dare you? How yeah. dare you, sir? I, I don't have to say it because you said it, so... <laughs> Uh, we we need, do need to talk about some of these other people. Like, we mentioned Beatrice Strait earlier. Like, uh, do we agree that, like, for that amount of time, she still earned her Supporting Actress nomination and win? I mean, I can't I can't say she deserved a win because I don't know who else was nominated that year. But it was an incredibly strong five-minute performance. Yes, absolutely. You love those little performances that definitely, you know, steal what little time that they're on screen. You know, that you remember them. And, and she certainly fits into that category. I Again, I yeah, I'm kind of with Adam. I don't remember what else was nominated that year. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, it's it, – every award this thing won, it deserved. It did break a lot of interesting records where it's like the one of the, the last movie to get nominated for like five acting categories – in one year, and like I mentioned, Peter Finch is like had the first posthumous Oscar, which was even like a weird sort of meta contextual thing about this was when he was nominated and then he passed away shortly before the ceremony happened. The network talked with the people who worked with network who should accept the board should he win, and they were like, oh, his wife who was like his last wife who was like this Jamaican woman, and they were like, uh, we don't like the optics on that because they hadn't had like somebody up on stage winning an award who was black since Hattie McDaniel at that point. And they're like, hmm, maybe we shouldn't have that happen. And then he, when he ended up winning, Pajewski went up there and said, you know, I don't know why I'm up here accepting this. And then he brought, like, he managed to get her to, like, come up and, like, actually have a beautiful acceptance speech and all this other stuff. So it just shows even at that time, Network was cuttingly satiric in a way that is even more further pressing as time goes along. I'm really glad you brought that up because I totally planned to because – you know, the Oscars for the celebration they are, they do have every once in a while a really classy moment. And that's one of my top classy moments of the Oscars is that is P Patty Chayefsky just saying, I don't know why I'm the one up here. Come up and accept your husband's, you know, award. And I just that Chayefsky 
man, he he did the right thing and pretty much just also gave a middle finger to both the studio and the Oscar production company because mm -hmm. they neither of them wanted this to happen. And he basically said, this is what's right. This is what is the right move is. And he went ahead and did it. And it's such a classy move on his part. You can find that clip on YouTube of him giving that award. It's uh, it's a beautiful moment. Yeah, I, I agree. And I mean, not only is it a, a fantastic moment and it is very sort of a middle finger. It's also transgressive at the time and really it wasn't supposed to happen. Like they literally, the Academy, yeah, we don't want her on because the optics are ever, we don't know how to film black people, which is just another way of saying we don't want black people on our show. It also wasn't only that she's black, it's that it was an interracial couple. Right, 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 right. No, yes, that too. So they don't want any controversy or whatever, but, you know, he was like, fuck it and you. <laughs> so, I mean, I agree. It's, it's a very powerful moment. And, I mean, it's the least they could do considering the fact that, like, at the time when Finch was doing this, he didn't tell anybody that he was in bad health. And you can kind of see it, unfortunately, in terms of the movie. Like, even, like, the infamous, like, I'm mad as hell speech is actually cut together between two takes. Like, the first half of the second take and then the second half of the first take. Because midway through that second take, he was just telling Sydney, like, I'm exhausted. I can't keep doing this. And it's like, no, it's fine. We got everything on that particular, like, first half of the take. But that that's almost adds this tragic authenticity to, like, the Howard Beale character, because as much as he is, like, this raving to televangelist type, um, there's still, at its core, this tragic human character who is really just, like, he's a man going insane, and you do almost want to reach out, like, an olive branch to him, especially because, like, he suddenly has all this fame, and it's just like, oh, my God, I finally have some kind of connection. I've been completely downplayed for, like, the last several years on this show and doing, like, really crappy news stuff. And I have some kind of affection and love, but it's really just, like, people pointing and laughing at him. Well, it's a man losing his mind, too, on screen. I mean, yeah. he's, he's lost it. He's completely off the fucking rails. There, there's a part of me that wonders how much of it is him losing his mind, however— he has the initial issue of being fired and that he doesn't respond well to. OK, that's that's obviously, you know, crisis moment. But how much as the movie progresses is it that he's out of his mind versus how much he's buying into his own press? When when Beatty has that epic speech about messing mm -hmm. with the primordial materials, you know, it's 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 a sobering moment for him. And the, the look on Finch's face is almost as if he has looked into the eyes of God here. And it's almost a reality check. I wonder if Chayefsky left it vague for the viewer to determine whether he's really losing his mind or whether he's buying into his own PR. Well, A, the going on air and saying, I'm going to kill myself in a week, right away you're nuts. I mean, he's lost it. The wandering out in the rain with the raincoat and the whole mad as hell speech. He's lost his mind. He's fainting on stage. He's so goddamn crazy. He's hearing voices at night, and he's reporting on camera what they are. And the fact that, I mean, yes, he's looking like he's looking in the face of God, because maybe in that moment he thought that was God. He's gone, dude. They just let an unhinged person on the air, and he's speaking, not exactly, but almost in fucking tongues the, with the, how all over the place he is. And it's just the the mass you know, public is just eating it up, so... In a way, maybe he's thinking, shit, maybe I'm not crazy because all these people seem to be behind me. But to me, there's no question. He's nuts because even when they're going up to see Ned Beatty and he's in the hallway, he's screaming and yelling about shit. Duvall has to basically pull him up the stairs to stop him. Yeah, and it, it sounds like the Ned Beatty thing. He's said this many times, like, don't ever count out being a day player. I was a day player on Network and I got an Oscar nomination out of it. And it's especially interesting because he wasn't originally the choice. They had gotten some other person and they weren't liking it. So they literally called him, like, on a Saturday about, like, hey, can you be here on Monday for this location where we only have, like, a day to use it? And he memorized his dialogue on the flight over, and then he ended up fucking delivering that goddamn Shakespeare soliloquy out there into the ether. It's so amazing. And it's, oh, God, yeah. And then just even, like, in this movie, there are all their great, like, small bits. Like, we haven't talked much about, like, the communists that are in this movie. I love that satirical element of it, all the communist stuff. And did you guys recognize one of the network executives during that communist meeting where, like, they shoot into the roof? Uh, you're going to have to refresh my memory. It's Lance Henriksen. Oh, <laughs> Lance yeah, Henriksen yeah, yeah. is one of the guys who's just, like, reading copy and, like, shoot in the air. And he's like, huh. Okay, anyway, so then if we look at the Dow here. <laughs> I did not. No, I did not. It's a very early Lance Henriksen role, yeah. Yeah, and the communist thing is almost a precursor to cops, the way that it's played out. Yes. You know, it's like all we need for today is for a cops episode to actually follow them 
you know, onto the studio to arrest uh, an anchor of some sort. That That's what we need. And then we have completely fulfilled the prophecy of this movie. I'm going to make you a star like Archie Bunker. <laughs> Just like, <laughs> it's it's all the, the great satirical stuff. We could go on and on. But we have a whole other movie to talk about. And we've gone on this for a while. So uh, your final thoughts, Rafe, on the network. If you watch this movie and you don't see connections that are coming 30, 40 years later, there you are deeply disconnected from the world. This is a frighteningly predictive film for the time that we live in. I wish we had solutions for it. I mean, we, we have the same thing kind of going with what Adam was saying. You know, we have newscasters go nuts, not to this level. And what happens? They get moved to a better time slot. You know, it, it, it still happens. And we have reality TV taking over everything. It's, Television is not the truth. It's a goddamn amusement park. The end. Well, Adam, your uh, cheery final thoughts on your own about network. <laughs> and uh, as I as I already said, it's it's one of the best movies I've ever seen that I get zero enjoyment out of actually watching. As far as uh, I don't want to say I'm not entertained by it because I definitely am because the performances and the story, the editing and everything. But it's a very somber feeling the second the movie ends. But if anybody hasn't seen this film, uh, even if you don't really buy into the messages or don't even care if it's prescient, just as a movie alone on technical aspects and acting and craft, if you rate on a top 10 scale, it's easily a 10. I mean, and how often do 10s come out every year? Uh, you know, this is, this is one of the greatest films ever made. And, uh, you know, anytime great movies are talked about, be it in clip shows or anything, the I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore scene is shown. Almost every time, if not every time. It, it, this is a very important film, just if you're a film lover. This is a very important, to me, uh, movie. And I don't say that about a lot of movies, but this one, to me, is important. Well, it's interesting. I'm glad you mentioned how many 10 rated movies do you get in a year. The other Best Picture nominees this was nominated against include Rocky, which won, All the President's Men, Bound for Glory and Taxi Driver. Okay, so you got five in that year. Yeah, you got, you got five. Damn, <laughs> <laughs> many cricket. That's a hell of a year. I, I don't know that Rocky was the right pick. Not that it's a bad movie, but as long as length goes, you know, as far as like again that perspective, that dis looking at it from a distance. Um, I, I would say this or all the president's men are a lot more culturally relevant as society has developed, although Taxi Driver certainly fits into that category. Although, you know, apparently we get a remake of that every 30 years. So, And even then, like with Iraqi, you have something that's like so I, I would argue it's very inherently like um, prescient and powerful in terms of just like sports filmmaking, like sports movies still take from that fucking movie. True. Alone true. And all this other stuff. So like it's just it's a very stacked year. A lot of great nominees there. Uh, but Network is definitely deserves to be, like, one of the ones that gets spread around more. If nothing else, I do agree. It has at least the most sort of, like, sadly true elements of, like, that just, like, stick true to our fucking modern lives. There, there's so much great satiric inherent stuff about just real isolation from each other and the media conglomerates and all this other stuff. And it's phenomenally performed and written all this other stuff. It's a perfect movie. On every level, for sure. Can we take last year's Oscar and give it to one of the other movies? <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the Green Book earned that fair and square. How dare you, sir? Do you think we'll be talking about Green Book in 30 years? <laughs> in the same way that we talked about Driving Miss Daisy last year at 30th anniversary. about Like, this is bullshit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> It'll be talked about the way Crash is talked about now. We're like, okay, why well, did this fucking win? I this still want to send Adam away. off, but I love Crash, so that's all I'm going to say on it. But... <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we we got to talk about one of Green Book's uh, competitors in a moment, but uh, before we do that, uh, why don't you go ahead and listen to this ad for an ESO show you could listen to right after ours. Hi, I'm Joe Heath. And I'm Tony Heath. And we host the watch a thon a A journey through all of Doctor Who, one serial at a time. Listen in and you will learn about... Two facts! Tune in and hear our... I know Find out how little we actually know about science, history, Doctor Who, and pretty much anything else. The Watchathon of Rassilon. A proud member of the ESO Network. Available wherever you get your podcast fix. Keep calm and wrestle on. Goodbye, and I love you. All right, and now we are talking about the 2018 Best Picture nominee and winner of several Academy Awards, Bohemian Rhapsody. 
enjoyed the show. I write songs. Our uh, lead singer just quit. Then you'll need someone new. Don't you see what you could be? Yeah! Yeah, we're four misfits who don't belong together. They're playing for other misfits. We belong to them. Love. Tragedy. Joy. It's something that people will feel belongs to them. So Bohemian Rhapsody came out uh, November 2nd, 2018. Uh, it was nominated for five Academy Awards. It won four of those. It was nominated for Best Picture. Didn't win that. Obviously, we talked about Masterpiece Green Book that won that particular award. Uh, but it did win for uh, Robbie Malik for Best Actor, Best Editing, Best Sound Mixing, and Best Sound Editing. Uh, noticeably, there's no nomination there for perhaps a Best Director, which I guess we should get this out of the way now. Uh, yeah. Because <laughs> uh, the, the big sort of like hullabaloo around this movie was that it's credited to Brian Singer, um, and Brian Singer did shoot most of it and planned out what was eventually shot by a Dexter Fletcher, uh, because Brian Singer had a lot of uh, sort of absences that he accounted for an illness in his family. Other people report that it was more clashes with people, which isn't new to Singer. You've heard any of his backstory, and then, of course, a lot of the uh, allegations that have come out about his sexual behavior. We aren't necessarily supporters of Brian Singer here. No, I'm going to go, go ahead right now and say if you put Hitler, well, that might not be good. Yeah, okay, let's, let's calm down. <laughs> there have been no allegations about him killing six million people yet. <laughs> That's true. That might have been a little off. I, I guess, and I, I don't want to go on too far a tangent here, but you know, you, I, I listen to you guys' podcast every week, and I, and I've, I've heard this kind of thing come up, particularly when it's Brian Singer or Kevin Spacey, because just those happen to be ones that come up. And I think the problem is we're too soon after those events. I mean, you can look at cinematic history, and it's, it's interesting we talk about network because it. It came into the spotlight a couple of years ago when Charlie Sheen was having his absolute, you know, batshit crazy meltdown. And so did another movie, uh, a fra- Face in the Crowd, which was directed by Elia Kazan. Elia Kazan named names uh, in the Red Scare trials and was black. You know, he, he wasn't blacklisted, but he led to many other people being blacklisted when he received his Lifetime Achievement Award from the Oscars. There were people booing and refusing to stand. And yet we still celebrate some of his movies. And I don't. I think we've, we've got to learn to separate art and artistry because 20 years down the road, we're not going to remember Brian Singer being a dick. No, 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 not... no. It's not Brian Singer being a dick. It's not Kevin Spacey being a dick. It's not Woody Allen being a dick or Roman Polanski being a dick. It's the fact that they are potential sexual predators in, in the worst possible way. That's something that, to me, is impossible to separate between the art and the artist. So do There's we just th- eliminate their films in, entirely? I mean, I guess the problem is, aren't we giving them added attention when we mention that behavior when we talk about the film? Wouldn't it be better to just re- for, just remove that element entirely instead of you know bringing it up every time? Well, no, no, I don't think so, because unfortunately it exists. It, 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 the fact that it happened, the fact that it exists, it has to be addressed if you talk about it. It's not that we're giving it more attention. I don't think we're giving it power. I don't think anything like that. But it is a fact now. This It almost, unfortunately, becomes a package deal when you're talking about some of these people. Well, well right, right. I, I, I definitely want to say that, like, everyone has their own line about, like, separate art from the artist and all this other stuff. This has been, like, it's a huge discussion that's been going on since, like, you know, the beginning of fucking art. But <laughs> I, I want to at least say that, like, with these discussions for me, I always think is, well, I think we can acknowledge that somebody has, like, had a, you know, particular status or a particular, like, impact on, like, film, music, whatever, while also acknowledging that they might be pieces of shit. And especially in a time where, like, more importantly, a lot of these people aren't really asked to answer for their crimes, you know, or potential crimes, necessarily, when a lot of them are just kind of, like, swept under the rug. I think it's important not to necessarily completely distance them from that, but to make that part of the discussion overall. Especially when it's somebody who's still around right now. I absolutely agree with you. I just, I feel like it's becoming too much a part of the the dialogue. Mm -hmm. And and again, that's just my opinion. And, you know, I'm certainly not going to tell you what to do with your show. But you're 100% entitled to that. And and I'm not saying it's a wrong opinion to have either. Because it's an opinion. And, you know, and it really, just real quick, and then we can get on to the shit show of a film. The the (laughs) fact of the matter is, these guys pull these things... And these things happen as the allegations, 
and then Kevin Spacey releases a haha video, or Brian Singer, yeah. his ten million dollar paycheck goes down to five million. I mean, that's what happens to these guys. It's it's ridiculous. But anyways, on to this <laughs> garbage fire of a bore. <laughs> well, 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 yes. Yeah, so- you know, we're here to talk about Bohemian Rhapsody, uh, which, uh, interestingly, despite, you know, all these things about Brian Singer, ended up being, you know, a $904 million grocer and was a huge crowd pleaser. I still hear people all the time who are, like, you know, around me might not necessarily be the biggest movie fans to talk about. Oh, yeah, one of my favorite movies from last year, Bohemian Rhapsody. I just loved having so much fun. I've heard people say it's their favorite movie. My, my girlfriend loves it. She was excited that I was going to have a reason to sit down and watch it. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, and, and I mean, admittingly, like, b- between the three of us, I'm sure all of us are fans of Queen and Freddie Mercury, just as an artist, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I I fell in love with Queen in late high school, which was unfortunately just shortly after Mercury's death. So that was poor timing on my part. But yeah, I I love Queen. I knew their songs before I knew who they were, you know, just from sports games or watching sports, you know, you hear we will rock you and we are the champions almost every goddamn game. And then, you know, Wayne's world. (laughs) It's like, I, when that came out, I got, I was, I don't know, 11, 12. And it blew my mind. So yeah, I mean, I love, absolutely love. And because of that move, Bohemian Rhapsody charted back up again, 16 years after Mm -hmm. it came out as this movie, like to mention also likes to reference with a certain cameo in this fucking movie that we'll get into in a second is like the biggest, one of the biggest fucking things I hate about this thing. But anyway, I know that, uh, Adam has clearly displayed a lot of his intentions and I know Rafe, uh, we actually talked about this when I was on your show, have not seen this, but when I talked about walk hard and you said you hadn't seen it at the time. Um, and now you have seen it for the purposes of our show. And uh, what'd you think of it? I have never been so bored watching a Brian Singer movie in my life. And it, you know, as I said, I'm a fan of Queen. What a sanitized load of dreck this film is as far as their actual history as a band. When Star Wars Episode Two came out, uh, I was working for a website, for a film review website, and the, the critic that wrote the review about it said that it is an hour and a half of ridiculousness that everyone will forget because the last 45 minutes are awesome. Speaking about the giant Jedi fight, Mm -hmm. this is uh, two hours of ridiculousness with 20 minutes of a recreation of a concert. That is what everybody remembers when they leave the the theater. And I don't even think that concert recreation, like the first two, three minutes of it feel really bad lip sync. The rest of it's pretty cool, but that's what people are leaving the theater thinking about between it being so sanitized and so boring. I just couldn't believe that this got all the attention that it got. Is Rami Malek good in it? Yeah, he's good. He's better on Mr. Robot. I think he'll be better as a Bond villain. Mm -hmm. But this is this is just such humdrum neutral blah. It's some of the worst, by the way, lip syncing I've ever seen is in this fucking movie. Uh, And that last 20 minutes, it's a poor recreation of something that you could just watch on YouTube and it's better. And. Yeah, Rami Malek. Yeah, he's he's okay in it. He's pretty good. He got the he got the body mo- movements down, the physicality down pretty good, for at least from what I've seen uh, of the real Freddie Mercury. But can okay, can we just address those horrible teeth that they put in his mouth, which I spent the first five minutes of the movie focused on. I of, know. Oh, Fred- he's got ridiculous teeth in his mouth. Right. I know Freddie Mercury had you know the extra four incisors or whatever the fuck they're calling it. And he had the, the bigger teeth. But Freddie Mercury also had a bigger face and better cheekbones than this than Rami Malek does. And they shove these giant teeth in his mouth. And it put it gives him like such an elongated fucking snout of a face. It looks ridiculous. It's just unbelievably almost comedic. He kind of looks like he's at like phase one of horseman transformation. <laughs> 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 how, could, how could anybody take it serious it's it's re- it is absolutely ridiculous feels like all of the awards this movie ended up getting were kind of like an appreciation of like wow you managed to keep this together because of the production that's what i feel like all of these like sort of wins were especially for editing and the acting performance god i like, know well, because, like, Malik is the most consistent thing about the movie, and I think he's really committed to it, and I think he has, like, the few interesting moments that happen are all him, especially when, like, any scene comes in with him and the band, you can clearly tell he's, like, carrying it because all those other fucking actors are not giving anything to do as the other members of Queen. 
I don't know that I agree completely with that. I really liked Gwilym Lee as Brian May. I thought he in particular uh, really like if if they had cut Taylor and Deacon out of the movie entirely, you still would have had the same movie. I don't feel like those characters really contributed anything, but I, I, I liked Lee. I, I mean, I think I agree. He looks the most accurate. He's he's an accurate sort of wax sculpture that moves pretty well. I, I do completely agree on that front. Um, but yeah, I, I think Deacon is also, I agree, like the, the least memorable. And doesn't. <laughs> I'm sorry to Tim from Jurassic Park, who's who that guy is. Which I did not realize until just a little while ago wait yeah. wait wait wait, wait. <laughs> and apparently adam didn't realize till now that is tim the human piece of toast yes that I say, that's big tim the human piece of toast yeah with the fucking wig from uh, venom uh-huh. that woody harrelson uh-huh. wore <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> all, all that they give him to do is just like hmm, i'm gonna like make a couple one-liners i'm over here smirking in the corner i'm gonna get made fun of a lot that's that's my whole role to, for freddie mercury to make fun of me that's the thing is like the the band chemistry I don't quite believe because it feels constantly like those three are just very boring people in the background who are just like hey Freddie you're doing a lot of like crazy shit over there and he's like just like shut up everybody I'm having fun and weirdly I think another big thing about this movie that I really dislike is the fact that it sort of lumps in Freddie's you know partying life with like his drugs and alcohol with his homosexuality almost the way that it's like portrayed I know. What's I thought the same thing. Like he goes to that bar or whatever, and it, there's like a bunch of like leather daddies all around and stuff. And then that's when he's starting to do pills and everything. like it's offensive. I'm not sure if it's like intentionally meant for the movie necessarily. That's what they're intending, but it comes off that way because it's so sidelined. Something big about <laughs> his, you know, fucking persona was his sexuality and even like his behind the scenes, you know, sexual activities. And every single time they sort of like reference anything about him being a homosexual, it almost feels like it's another vice. Yeah, like another part of his lascivious lights lifestyle. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. The the number one thing a story needs is conflict, right? I mean, that's that's kind of the the heart of any story is some form of conflict, right? Yes. This film lacks conflict, and the irony of that is this band, these four people, were nothing but conflict throughout so much of their career. It, it, it's been documented in in documentaries and behind the music on VH1 and and books that they were constantly at each other's throats over whose songs were going to get included and who got the the rights to the lyrics and and that kind of stuff. They were constantly bickering until Mercury announced or to them because he announced it privately about contracting AIDS. And that was the point that they came together and started really unified as queen. There's so much potential that could have been in this story from the four of them bickering and arguing and siding with each other and that kind of stuff. And it's just not there. That's a great point. There is all this history and documentation in in actual documentaries and written articles about the turmoil that was constantly, you know, ebb and flow through the band. So what do they do in this film? They create a conflict to where the band splits up because he got a solo deal. Right, which they never did. No, they did not at all. So, But they, they make it happen, whatever. And that he announces he has AIDS a week before their Live Aid show also didn't happen. Right. I mean, that's ridiculous. Right, right. Even though, like, you know, movies, like, biopics make up, like, conflict things all the time, like, story structure, like, move things around. That's not necessarily the problem as much as, like, when you have so much fruitful material to actually make conflict and you just regurgitate the same bullshit biopic structure. That's why I was talking oh, about Ray's show, was yeah. how much this is just walk hard without fucking jokes. And, and actually, I would go the opposite direction with it and say, I wish they had watched Walk Hard to get a better idea of how to do this, because at least structure. Walk Hard was an interesting story structure. Yeah. It may have been, like, the archetypal structure done to the extreme, but it had a structure, and this just flows nowhere. I mean, it's just so boring. It's cookie cutter bullshit. It's every biopic you've ever seen, every really poorly done biopic you've ever seen. I mean, it's the same stakes. It's the same character realizations. It's the same conflicts and personalities. It's everything I've seen a hundred times over just with a dude with horse teeth. And it's Mike fucking... Myers for no inexplicable. Oh, God. Yeah. Oh, Why the God. fuck is he in this movie before Adam can just ask that? For that question? line. For that line. 
kids Which won't is, be hang, head banging into their cars to this. So if it's going to be self-aware, then make it self-aware and get it in a lot more gags and jokes and such. Now, the one thing that does, I, I agree with you, but the, the, what doesn't bother me about that, because it did bother me when I first saw it, but uh, I talked to my wife about it and everything, and, and she did make a good point to me that that was a big deal, that song being in that movie, because it did push it back in the charts. And Mike Myers single-handedly forced them to use that song. So I don't mind them maybe throwing him a bone or whatever, but when that's the only thing they give that character to say, basically, then it's just, it's stupid. No, they needed to have Rob Lowe or Christopher Walken play that part, who, whichever one was the bad guy in that Wayne's World movie. I mean, it's it's, it's so, it's... It's meta, it's self-aware, and it's not, it doesn't fit in this film. No, honestly, the, the part that almost infuriates me more is that they cut to him during the Live Aid finale, where it's just like they have no time for losers and they cut to Mike Myers. It's just like, it shows just like how completely, like, base level this whole thing is. And it, it's oh. just like, so much of, like, we haven't even talked about, like, the fact that John Ottman got, a, like, a, not an award for editing this movie is baffling. Because at best, it's competent, oh. and at worst, it's, like, the choppiest thing. It's so bad. It, is it competent? Y- yes, I do think it's competent. It's not at the level that people are giving it credit at, I mean, at all. And if you want to talk about offensive things paired up with music scores, when he find out he has AIDS... And they're playing the Who Wants to Live Forever from Highlander. I'm like, oh, no. (laughs) This is ridiculous. Uh, I had heard that the editing was bad on this, so I kind of went in expecting the worst. It's not that bad. It's just not notable. I mean, it's certainly not great. Uh, Does it deserve an Oscar? No, I completely agree with you that it was kind of handed to him as a thanks for saving our movie type thing. Uh, and on the Who Wants to Live Forever front, why didn't they use Mercury's last recorded song? Uh, These Are the I, Days of Our Lives was the last music video he recorded. I agree. Why not? That would have made more sense. Yeah. But that's not one people know about, Rafe. The, and that's the biggest... also a reason why I think this movie did win awards. Not only because they saved it from Brian Singer, but the fact that Queen has had this huge resurgence in popularity again. To where you got 13-year-old kids wearing Queen shirts and everybody, you know, Fred, greatest singer of all time. Fucking, you ask 10 people, at least half of them are going to say Freddie Mercury. I mean, it's this huge, huge resurgence. And I think that's another reason. It's, oh, let's give it to the Queen movie. You know, the Oscars are hip. I honestly think so. Because there's nothing in this movie, to me, be it Rami Malek's performance, the editing, any of it, that's... Oscar worthy, Academy Award worthy, the best of the best of the year. You're telling me this won awards? What the fuck? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Thomas. Uh, Fletcher went and did Rocket Man after this, right? Yes, he actually got the job from like his few dailies that like people saw. It's like, oh, well, how about we hire you to do Rocket Man, which is a thousand times better. <laughs> Infinitely better film. Infinitely better film. Is that even nominated for shit? It's nominated for the Oscar baby new song that Elton John wrote for like the end credits. That's, like, it? that's it. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's, but this, but this was nominated for fucking five awards. Are you and, kidding me? And, right. And the strength of that movie is the fact that they don't like, for the most part, don't play it as like a traditional biopic. It kind of does that near the end of the movie. And that's like the weakest part sure. of it is that it goes more into like biopic traditional stuff, but they play as like more of like a jukebox musical where, like, mm-hmm. with any of these biopics, especially if the person's alive to consult, or in, in the case of this one, like, the other band members, and it's like, what, Taylor and May are executive producers on this, and they were, mm-hmm. like, heavily involved in the production. Like, yeah, because they're still some... technically queen. They're still technically the Right, band. exactly, yeah. When you have people involved, it inherently is going to be a sanitized version of the original sort of actual story. But with a Rocket Man, they were just like, okay, we're going to embrace the fact that this isn't reality, and just go into, like, weird, fanciful stuff with how we do our various different production numbers, which oh. works tremendously well for most of them. Not a biggest fan of The Last Man. Uh, I'm still standing at the end, where it's just like, let's put Taron Edgerton into that music video. That felt really weird yeah, when we end that movie. Real kind of poorly. Real kind yeah. of poorly. Like, I was fine with him doing it in the hospital, but in the video, you're like, what? Okay. <laughs> right, right. Well, and, and Edgerton sings. Yeah, and he's yeah, and he's fantastic, which apparently Rami Malek does sing as well. I don't uh, buy that for a second. I watched well, this no, movie. No, wait. No, I agree with you. 
because instead of they used his voice very sparingly, either that they used offcuts of Freddie Mercury or a guy who won a sing along contest. Right, like they they meld the tracks together, yeah, in a way that feels very artificial. The whole yep. way. yeah. I mean, we both have said it's not a good oh, lip sync. So, so if, if it was his own voice, the lip sync wouldn't be having as many problems. His tongue doesn't move, <laughs> if you know, because they show his mouth open quite a bit. No, that's true. His yeah. tongue doesn't move. No, your yeah, tongue moves. Uh, but I, that's all stuff that's been commented on in terms of like how sort of bad some of these elements are. The underrated, horrible thing about this movie to me is how it's shot. The cinematography, it's so mm-hmm. lifeless. Like, the whole point of, like, Queen and Freddie Mercury and all this other stuff was, like, oh, man, they're, like, a colorful, vibrant band. Like, did the fucking score for Flash Gordon, one of the most colorful, silly movies ever made. Like, that's part of their appeal. And this movie is shot like it's fucking seven. I don't know about that. That's a little... (laughs) All the color is drained out of this movie at any time, even during, like, the Live Aid bit. Like, it's very drained Mm -hmm. of any actual color. Well, yeah, yeah, what they do do is they duplicate the crowd, which is so fucking obvious. Yeah, there oh, were like two, maybe three shots that really stood out to me. Otherwise, and I, I wouldn't be surprised to find out that that was, you know, done by the replacement as opposed to Singer. But yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, it's just a bland movie. It's a stale, boring, paint-by-numbers biopic. That's, I mean, that's really what it is. And the thing is, you know, you read where they wanted it to be focused on Queen and not just Freddie Mercury. Well, that obviously didn't fucking happen. Queen are side characters, the rest of the band. But importantly, they're not the people that do all these horrible things, Adam. They're good guys who, like, when they're at the party, they're like, oh, we're going to have a drink, but then leave with our wives. We didn't do anything awful. Yeah, no, no, no. They, <laughs> drugs are bad. No, we're not doing this. <laughs> I mean, come on. Don't be wrong. Was Freddie Mercury maybe a, a, a drama queen and a tyrant? I'd be willing to bet money on it. But you can't tell me these. that was their biggest conflict with him. You're controlling too much. You're late all the time now. It was nothing else. It, it, it's just, they don't matter. Even Brian May, like, don't remember Brian May, the only reason you remember him, A, because he does look like a fucking duplicate of Brian May. It's very disturbing and weird, and I don't like it. But <laughs> he has the most interaction with him. That's the only reason you remember him, because he has the most back and forth with him, which is not much. It's a couple lines here and there. But the other two are just throwaway, forgettable characters, completely. Because we had to make more room for Lucy Boynton being like, oh, I'm your conscience. I'm like your connection back to the straight world. How dare you do all this like horrible drugs, alcohol, and gay shit. That's that's what she is. And then you have like his like domineering boyfriend who's like one of like the stalest fucking elements Mm -hmm. of this movie. Just I don't believe any of their chemistry and every time they like interact. It's just like it's a it's a weird sort of like 80s era like don't be gay kids fucking dad that's what it basically feels like i agree and and then this relationship with his father they try to make important you don't give a fuck you see his father in the beginning of the movie but maybe an hour in and then the last five minutes you see him again and you're like oh well his father does care about him like i don't care his father didn't cut him in half with a machete yeah (laughs) that's true he didn't that's true he did not did not have him he did right. You're 100 percent right. Part of that also, Adam, is that there's there's no real development of Freddie Mercury as a character. I, is he a drama queen? Yes, but he's also that from the very beginning. Is he a weirdo? You know, who thinks the world re- revolves around him? Yes, but he's also that at the beginning. He doesn't let celebrity go to his head. Every character trait that they kind of criticize later on in the movie, he's had from the start. Oh, I completely agree with you. I, I was saying in relation to the real Freddie Mercury. Where was the real Freddie Mercury probably these things? Yes. And did he develop some of these traits? Maybe. Or maybe he was that way from the start. But they don't even try to make this version of Freddie Mercury have any character growth, any sort of defining moment, you know, moment of clarity, anything. His moment of clarity is like Tom Sardi said, his his girlfriend slash ex-wife savior comes in and you're better than this. You don't need this. That guy's not good for you. When he's standing in the rain, who you'll fly and get out of here. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, Rami Malek in the studio, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm sorry. Hold on. Let me put my fucking donkey teeth in. Um, <laughs> but I mean, that's, that's it. That's all they give him. They give him one scene 
of him standing in the fucking rain, which is so yep. goddamn cliche. You know, you feel bad for me, you're fired. And then that's it. Oh, everything's okay now. It's a bore to watch because nothing fucking happens. And what does happen, you've already seen. I've already seen the Live Aid show in real life. I already know it. Nothing works. Nothing is exciting. Nothing is poignant or makes you think or really even feel bad for anybody. Or, oh, my God, the plight he went through because it's all fucking fabricated at the same time, too. It's all none of it lines up the way it correctly did. None of the conflicts actually happened. It's just it's fucking ridiculous and a waste of time. Those sound like final thoughts. So I don't know if you have much else to say on that front. Um, but Rafe, what about what are your final thoughts on Bohemian Rhapsody? You know, I mean, it's it's sanitized because of May and Taylor being producers. They obviously wanted you know the band to come out in a good light, and I I can respect that, but. I think they either really should have pushed for their original idea, which is to have Freddie Mercury's death not be the final event of the film, but rather be able to focus on the surviving members of the band and or, or for that matter, any of the other characters. Like, as you said, she provides his conscience. But so how does she react when he dies? You know, that would have been maybe interesting to see. Or if you're going to sanitize it to make the band look good, just go whole hog on the villain. Have him be mustache twirling. You know, you already got Mike Myers and that ridiculous fucking beard. Um, you know, go go whole hog on some other character and, and you know, throw in some laser beams and sharks with freaking lasers on their heads or something. I don't know. This movie needed <laughs> something. And Mike Myers wasn't it. No, Mike Myers was not it at all. Yeah, it's it's the problem of, like, really trying to service everybody. Of just, like, hey, let's service Queen fans by doing some winks and nods. Let's service, like, average audiences by making this a palatable, familiar biopic structure. Let's, you know, service Queen themselves by saying, oh, hey, we were totally good guys. And we loved Freddy, but Freddy and his shenanigans, all of his drugs, alcohol, and gay stuff. That's, that's the biggest thing, really. It's just that, like, they totally through either sheer intent or more likely incompetence of this production turn Freddie Mercury somebody who like we all love who's like an icon his like stance when he has like the yellow jacket and everything is like one of the most iconic images of music in general the last like 50 years and they turn him into like this character who like oh he ends up like coming out of his shell and becoming who he is you know this person who is bisexual and all this other stuff and they turn that into a vice and that is such, like, a massive problem I have with this movie to where, you know, everybody who likes it, all the $904 million worth of people who, like, really went to this and loved it in droves, good on you. But I feel like this is one of the exact examples of when any, whenever anyone talks about, like, lazy-ass Oscar bait and really bad biopics. This is chief among them. And I just recommend you watch Walk Art instead. As I talked about on Race Show. Listen to that episode, too, instead of watching this movie. <laughs> but... <laughs> That is the end of our discussion on our two multi-Academy Award-nominated films, uh, but we have some feedback to read because every Monday at DEDV Pod on Facebook and Twitter, those pages, we uh, ask you all about, like, hey, what are your favorite, least favorite examples of uh, whatever topic we're doing? And so we asked a bunch of people out there about that for multi-Oscar-nominated movies, and uh, we have an issue, a uh, couple comments are just talking about this year's nominations alone, with uh, Andrew Salmon says, Joker deservedly snatching 11 nominations with so much of the press against it is noteworthy. Uh, Dimitri Fiani at Dimitri Fiani on Twitter says, uh, Parasite for fave and least favorite Joker. And then uh, James Rodriguez had a bit more of a historical context here with his uh, favorites and uh, least favorites on here where he says, uh, films I like, Mudbound, Hell or High Water, Whiplash, Parasite, The Social Network, Lost in Translation, There Will Be Blood, Children of Men. On the opposite side that I can't stand, The Danish Girl, Transformers Dark of the Moon, Tim Burns' Alice in Wonderland, and Bohemian Rhapsody. Yep. Well, I think now we're at the part of our show where we have to address Joker because it was brought up. <laughs> um, now, I just recently saw it. I'm going to go on record and say I didn't hate it. Actually, I kind of liked it quite a bit. I do think Joaquin Phoenix is absolutely fantastic in it. However, 11 Oscar nominations? It is outrageous. It is absolutely outrageous. I'm going to refrain from talking for a bit on the subject. Uh, put a pin in that for the end of the show. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I have not seen Joker yet. It's, okay. uh, I, it, because of all the reviews from, from people whose opinions I, I trust and respect, you know, the, all the references, as you made earlier, to, you know, Taxi Driver and uh, other movies, I, I just, 
I don't really have a ton of desire to see it, and I probably need to fix that before Oscar night. But, you know, one of my favorite things about the Joker as a character is that he's such an enigma, and I have zero interest in seeing an origin story for a character who doesn't need or actually have one. It's a multiple choice to quote the killing joke. That's the sort of the point. Yeah. Um, right. But in terms of, I guess, like some of these other, like in general with Oscar history, um, what are some favorite and least favorite examples of like ones that just like got a bunch of like nominations for you guys. Well, uh, not to get Adam's ire, but I loved crash. I think it deserved the nominations that it got. <laughs> well, well, I want to hear this. Cause this is like the most hottest take you could possibly have. So keep going. Rafe. Well, now I have to say, I have not revisited it since it first came out on DVD because I was reviewing DVDs at the time. I watched it then for the second time because I had seen it in theaters and I still loved it. I, I wrote a re glowing review about it. I probably need to go back and watch it, but I I loved the, the diversity of the stories. I, I loved the, its theme, this idea of uh, us being so numb. We don't feel anything until we crash into each other. Um, I... I particularly loved and i just went blank on the actor's name hispanic actor from ant-man um oh, michael pena yeah i particularly loved michael pena's storyline um it just really connected with me emotionally you know it's very easy to look at that character and make a judgment and then find out the the depth of his actual story and i i just i feel like that that thesis that we judge people based on looks and we don't really know their full stories is a valid one. And I think it's still relevant now. I, I need to go back and revisit it, but that's, I really connected with that movie for some reason. No, I remember when I first saw it, I remember connecting to it. Um, and I was just like really wrapped up in all the drama, the stories as you're mentioning, all this other stuff. Um, but then again, I was a child. Um, and then also, um, when I ended up revisiting it and I heard so many people hating on Crash, I was just like, maybe I should, like, take a second look at this. And I was like, oh no, this is bullshit. Just, I think, much like Paul Haggis' other work, I'm just not a fan of that dude in general. Um, honestly, with some of the other stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the one that James listed that I, I, I have to admit I got wrong at the time is The Social Network. Because while I enjoyed it as a story, my argument was how many of us are actually going to remember Facebook 10 years later? <laughs> <laughs> Joke's on me. <laughs> <laughs> and frankly, the story continues to be relevant. So I got that one wrong when it first came out. <laughs> no, I recently visited that while we were um, in pro like going to do our like best and worst of the decade shows a couple weeks ago. Um, and I still think that one holds up tremendously well. If nothing else, like rewatching, I was just like, given all the history of Facebook in the last 10 years, just like, we're kind of overdue for a sequel. Where just right. Rosenberg goes full like Hannibal Lecter <laughs> in the way that <laughs> fucking Zuckerberg basically has become. Uh, I, I think another one that maybe got a little bit more attention than deserved is American Hustle. Oh, yeah. For one. Mm. And Vice as well. Uh, it, it just... It, it's, it's fine. There's good performances and everything, but it's not the greatest film of that year by any means. Well, yeah, the Oscars tend to get sort of swept up in sort of the, uh, the flash of something like that or a vice where you sort of have like these central performances and these like big elaborate sort of showy displays of like, Oh my God, look at our big ass sprawling cast and what they're all going to do. And them just being so manic and over the top in a way that like those movies end up becoming the kind of movies you look back on and you're like, Oh, this got so much attention. I think just cause it builds up all that hype and sort of the campaigning and all this other stuff that we haven't even gone into with like the Oscar stuff that a certain um, person who's on trial right now kind of created in the late nineties, the whole concept <laughs> of campaigning. Um, I, I think th th those are both are big examples of like that sort of like big hype and swept into it. And also like, obviously with Christian Bale, like, Oh my God, he got fat. Look at him. He's fat. It's Batman. He's fat. Yep. Batman is fat man. I wish we had blown up more on him when he got so scrawny for the machinist. Cause that was a far better movie. Yeah, <laughs> for sure on that. Um, but instead we gave him the Oscar for a scrawnier performance in the fighter. A scrawny. Not performance true. In the fighter. Yes. Which is better. And also just in the topic of like these David O. Russell movies, with Amy Adams in them fucking no Amy Adams win yet. Like how, how has that not happened yet? <laughs> Well, has she not won at all yet? No, she has not. She's been nominated multiple times. She's our generation's Glenn Close, unfortunately, which just keeps getting like past fucking over. Well, the thing is, I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I do like Amy Adams, but I also get it too. Uh, to me, Amy Adams personally has never like blown me away with anything I've seen. I, I think she's really good. I think she's incredibly reliable. 
I think she's incredibly consistent, but I've never been, you know, gobsmacked by a performance of hers. She, she should have gotten the best supporting for her on her couple of scenes in that alone. I, I do agree with that. And I also have a lot of issues with this movie, but the fact that she didn't even get nominated for a rival is a crime. Cause I would say like with all my issues with that movie, none of them are her. And I think she totally keeps that movie together. Um, and she is just like, especially so devastated and so haunted in a way that I rarely see actual other actors authentically do. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, it's just, it's just, I think she's going to be just another one of those career people that wins in like another 10 years or so for some bullshit movie no one cares about and completely destroys some other person who should have gotten that win anyway. Just that happens all the time. I, I'm okay with that as long as that means we get another 10 years of really good Amy Adams performances. No, I'm. you're right. I'm still not okay with it because it, you should get it for the role that you earned it for, not for a library of work. Yeah. Then again, I guess it's more of an insult when you have, say, like the DC movies where she's Lois Lane and she gets to do nothing. That's, I guess, more of a big problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I do want to definitely second, I've said it before, but countless times over, Parasite is definitely, I'm so glad that it got so much like sweeping nominations this year. Though at the same time, it is also notable that uh, that's the first time a South Korean movie has ever been nominated for an Oscar period, even an international film. Ooh, that might be a shoe in then. That well, might be the shoe in for the win. I mean, for the win on that one, yeah, because um, they're probably not going to give it Best Picture on that, just given yeah. like, biases and shit. Um, but, but yeah, right, if you have right. not seen Parasite, don't read up about anything about it and then watch it. <laughs> yeah, that's I have not seen it yet. And uh, that's exactly what I keep hearing is nobody wants to talk about it who's seen it because they don't want to ruin anything for people like me who haven't. So, And it's, it's top of my list. I just need to get a chance, to, an opportunity to do it. Plus, I also just love that Bong Joon-ho has become like the adoring dad of this Oscar season. Like when all the, the cast won the SAG Award, he's just got his fucking iPhone <laughs> shooting off to the side like, there are my kids. Look at him. <laughs> I just love seeing him especially, and he's even been talking about just like all oh, the one inch barrier thing. I love that that's become a discussion point now about just like, you know, you could really open yourself to more films if you get over that one inch barrier of the subtitles. I just love nothing else that that's happening by him going around doing the rounds. Good for him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, that's the end of our feedback section. We want to thank you all for that feedback. We also want to thank some other people like Chris Oliver for the intro and outro music used in our show. Listen to more of his music at chrisoliver.bandcamp.com. Thanks to Emily Scarter for the art for our show. And thanks, of course, to Mr. Rafe Telsch for gracing us with his presence once again. Rafe, plug yourself. I love coming on this show, but I do have my own podcast. Both of you have appeared on. Thomas is in episode two. Adam is in episode 11. The podcast is called Have Not Seen This where we take an in-depth look at a movie each week picked by the guest. I don't get a say in the movie selected. Uh, And uh, this week's, or when this comes out, the current episode will be Rules of Attraction. And then the day after this episode comes out, my episodes come out on Wednesdays, and that'll be Midnight Run, which completely changed Mm. how I look at De Niro outside of Mafia Pictures. Oh, wow, yes, that's a a great one. Um, And I'll say Mm -hmm. that uh, the podcast that the two of you did and had not seen this, got me to finally see Dark City. Oh, what did you excellent. think? Excellent. Um, I really do dig it. I would, I will say, I would love it even more if I think the main performance from it's Rufus Sewell, right, is the main guy. Yeah, yes. I think he's like yes. the the huge problem I have with the movie because I think he's very bland and not in like a fun Keanu in the Matrix way. It feels a bit more just like kind of a blank slate to me in a way that I wasn't as engaged as I think I could have been, but everything else about the movie is tremendous. Yeah, both of you picked great movies. I really enjoyed our conversations about it. Uh, just had a lot. I, I enjoyed talking movies with you guys, so. Oh, shucks. Well, Rafe. if you decide at one point to do return guests, I got a movie already ready. <laughs> oh, good to know. Yeah, I, I think I'm going to, I've got a certain benchmark I want to reach before I do that. But uh, yeah, I think I'm going to end up having repeat guests soon. Yeah, don't invite me. Fuck you. Oh, no, you're, <laughs> dude, you and I already talked about it. <laughs> <laughs> These backdoor conversations, fake news, that isn't real. But uh, we uh, want to definitely encourage you to, along with listening to Rafe's show, to definitely continue listening to ours and following us on Twitter and Facebook at DEDB Pod. I also uh, will we'll accept emails over at uh, doubleedgedoublebill at gmail.com, all spelled out. Um, or you can follow me on my own individual account at not the who's Tommy on Twitter and Instagram, where I post musings and pictures and such. Um, and I do some writing at, uh, both true superhero fans.com, 
uh, which is a satirical superhero site where I write fun articles like that. Um, and I also do uh, some reviews and other things and even post the episodes of this show at marianithomas.wordpress.com. That's my blog. I will have a review right now, uh, my first of 2020, about uh, Color Out of Space, the new film from Richard Stanley, who we talked about in terms of The Island of Dr. Moreau, the H.P. Lovecraft adaptation starring Nicolas Cage. And that movie's about as wild as you expect, given all those factors. Excellent. It's so good. And uh, also, uh, you can subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, and other places where podcasts are available. And uh, if you listen to us on ESO, why not dig into the archives for the first several episodes of our show? And uh, if you can, rate, review, or just share the show around to give us more visibility. We always appreciate that, if you can. Yeah, I don't think it's that big of a fucking deal. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like is it that hard? Like, seriously, it's gonna, that's going to make or break your fucking day? Yeah, make sure we, we can't have the Mike Myers of the world saying no one will ever know the name Double Edge Double Bill. We can't have that. We can't. That's probably true, though. I mean, probably, yes. Of course. Fuck. Except for the dozens of you that listen to us. Dozens. Dozens. Wow, we've hit dozens? Do I know. Holy shit. It's, yeah, we're really moving that's, up in the world. That's wild. Uh, but, well, I bet oh, they're all, all of them are last name Thomas or Mani or Mario. <laughs> I guarantee it. <laughs> I don't know. Thomas is a pretty uh, common last name, and I found that Mariani is basically the Smith of Italy, so who knows? <laughs> oh, well, <the> shit. <laughs> but anyway, uh, before we head out of here, because we're getting a bit loopy, uh, we have to do our picks for next week. We're revisiting a topic we've done previously. Uh, we are doing DC Comics films, not of Birds of Prey is coming out, which looks interesting, if nothing else. I'm very curious to see uh, Margot Robbie kind of taking her reign and making the DC universe a bit more... Uh, female criminal and such it looks like it could be fun it's gonna suck come on i don't know it's like gonna D suck. dc has had an interesting sort of um range of films in the last couple of years that make me more curious for it and nothing I else the fact that like margot robbie's the only like real returning character from any of those other movies i think yeah. dc learned from shazam that if they go a more comedic route they tend to do better and i think this is going to end up being better than suicide squad in particular well, but i think it's going to end up being one of their better films well we'll see i hope so i mean i really do but we make a special caveat for this particular DC Comics episode, because if you listen to our last one, that was episode 33 a while ago, uh, we uh -huh. ended up with two Batman movies, and uh, we kind of realized, yeah, if we ever do this again, we're going to kind of put a caveat that um, for our selections, we negated anything where Batman is a major character. So we're not doing any Batman Returnses or the Dark Knights none of that. If he has maybe a small role, like say, I have the bad picks, but I did not pick Suicide Squad... That would have counted because he only has like a couple fleeting appearances, as an example. I definitely did not pick Suicide Squad. <laughs> <laughs> no, for oh, your two good picks, okay. yes. So uh, yes. you have your two good picks, Adam. I have my two bad picks. And we've each assigned numbers between 1 and 10 for both of those picks. Uh, and usually we would pick uh, number between 1 and 10 for each other's choices and get our good and bad feature for whichever goes closest. But when we have a guest like Rafe, they go ahead and uh, choose. They open the envelope and reveal who it's going to be. So Rafe... Adam's two good choices. Number two and one and ten. For the good choice, the winner is number two. Okay, at number three, a film directed by who is considered one of the greatest of the modern horror genre, you have Swamp Thing by Wes Craven. Oh, wow, that's a deep cut. I did not expect yeah, that. Yeah, but, well, you know. <laughs> and then I also had at number nine, I had V for Vendetta. Because oh. while it is a problematic movie, I do enjoy it. And that's also technically an imprint because of Vertigo. Well, it's DC Vertigo, buddy. You know, that's true. It, <laughs> it popped up on all those lists. They ended up getting so that's interesting. Swamp thing. All right, but now Ray for my two bad picks. Number two, one and ten. And for number ten, the winner is number two. No, wait, sorry, it's number seven. What? I had to have my La La Land Moonlight. Barry Jenkins is number seven. One, I can't believe it. Oh, but you know. At number six, funny we were talking about some of this earlier, I have the Oscar darling Joker. Uh, okay, <laughs> and what's your other choice? Um, at number one, I had Superman for the Quest for Peace, which is a pretty bad one, but I would also <laughs> watch it any day over Joker. <laughs> I'll tell you what, dude, I, I you know, because I something told me that Thomas is going to pick the Joker for one of these. I almost, just to throw a curveball, was going to throw the Joker as in one of my good picks. And hope that they landed and we'd have a full Joker episode <laughs> just to see what would happen. <laughs> Though that's some real Joker stuff. Hey, hey Adam, who Ooh. has two thumbs and doesn't have to watch Joker for next week's show? This guy. That's, uh, 
you'd fit right at home in that movie with that awesome joke. Real biting <laughs> character. <laughs> that great joke that just feels sad and alone yep. and depressed in the yep. corner. Yes. Yes, so that'll be interesting. Joker and Swamp Thing. What a fun ride that'll be. But it's fucking bizarre. Whatever. <laughs> yes, but until then, everybody, good night. That's the end of the ceremony. Make sure to uh, pick up after yourselves. Have a good evening. Yeah. See ya. <laughs> I don't know why I did Eeyore just that. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for noticing. You Bye. like me. You really, really like me. has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon or by shopping through Amazon.com or the Tee Public Store, which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network, your station for all things geek.